in his career on onside kicks. In a few days, 100 million people or more will be glued to their TVs watching the biggest sports event of the year, the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, many of these viewers will be underage youth and they will be subjected once again to numerous Disney-esque ads for Budweiser and Bud Light beer. Hi, I'm Bruce Lee Livingston, CEO and Executive Director of Alcohol Justice. Studies show that the more alcohol ads kids see, the better the chance that they will drink and in many cases, they will binge drink. The alcohol industry knows that the younger a person starts drinking, the bigger the probability that that person will be a customer for life. The billions big alcohol spends advertising alcohol during sporting events leads to increased underage drinking as well as turning fun-filled family events into drunken, harm-filled experiences. Even though the NFL has been at the center of some of the biggest scandals in the last few years involving drugs, alcohol, and domestic violence, this year's Super Bowl will be best remembered for its commercials, many of them for beer. Those ads will play, tens of millions will watch, and the NFL and AB InBev will profit in total disregard for the negative effect that alcohol misuse plays in the lives of viewers and players alike. All right, great to see you, Ethan. Today we have the great pleasure of talking to former San Francisco 49er and Super Bowl champion Ethan Ramson about his life, his past career with the NFL, and his problems with alcohol and drug use that ended that career. We'll also talk about how he fought his way back to do the important work he now does with youth at the Bayview Hunters Point YMCA in San Francisco. Love yourself. People who love themselves don't use drugs and alcohol. All right, great to see you, Ethan. Good morning. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your work here? at uh, the YMCA? I am the <clears throat> senior director for youth development, um, uh, youth and teen here at the Bayview Hunters Point YMCA. Uh, I started here um, as a director slash principal for, um, to organize and develop a, a program called Center for Academic Reentry and Empowerment, which is a care program. That program, what we do is we work with youth who are disconnected from their educational path, and we help them get re-engaged, put them back on track, and our objective is to transition them back to San Francisco Unified. The older population, we transition them to Five Keys so that they can graduate here in-house. In and Five Keys is the uh, charter school Five Keys program. Charter School, yes. And they're disconnecting in terms of truancy, doing their schoolwork, and sometimes they have alcohol and drug problems? Well, alcohol and drug problems are usually the leading causes why they, they're disconnecting. Um, it's because they've, they've resorted to some type of substance to, to pad or, or cushion their weight so that they, um, they call it the, um, manage their, their emotions. <laughs> but. They call it self-medication. Self-medication, absolutely. Right. So you bring your experience with drugs and alcohol uh, to them, and you're very honest about that. Absolutely, and, and that's um, that's what we call cultural competency and, and, uh, and meeting them where they are. Um, I understand the, the, the path that they've traveled, and we engage them and meet them where they are and work with them and build them up and address those by addressing those issues and help them transcend those barriers. So tell me a little bit about what it is that happened in your background uh, before you became a professional uh, football player. <clears throat> what brought you into alcohol and drugs and how has that influenced your life? Well, alcohol and drugs was first, um, my first experience with, with experimenting. <laughs> Um, with alcohol and drugs was, was um, during my freshman year in, in college. Uh, I stayed away from it in high school. Um, but when I got to college, I got away from home, away from mom and dad, you know, got on my own. You know, I had a, I had a roommate that uh, smoked uh, wheat, uh, pot every day and smoked it around me. And eventually, you know, the, 
peer influence, you know, I, I caved in and, and started to experiment myself. And so you started with marijuana? Started with marijuana. Um, and shortly, shortly after that, um, because of, you know, the, the uh, parties on, on Fraternity Row and, and all the um, frat parties and kegger parties, um, I started to, to experiment and drink beer. And that led to me getting so, so involved and so off track until I almost flunked out of, out of my first semester in school. And you were already on the football team too? Yeah, I was there on, on full scholarship. You, you don't maintain your grades, you lose your, you lose your scholarship. <laughs> yeah. So um, you were regularly using marijuana and, and uh, beer. And uh, did you start hitting heavier liquor or other not, drugs not a, at that time? Not, not at that time, no, no. I was just, you know, I, I was experimenting. Um, that lasted uh, less than about half, halfway through the semester, about half a semester, about three months. And I, I, right. I saw the effects and, and uh, I didn't want to lose my scholarship, so I got a new roommate. <laughs> right. And, 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 I, and I refocused and I regrouped with the people I was hanging around with and, and got back on track. So when did you join the NFL? Um, 19, 1978, I was dra drafted right. um, to the NFL. Did you finish college and then you were drafted? Yeah. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, so what was your experience with alcohol and drugs uh, in the NFL now? When did it start going downhill? <sighs> okay. Well, you know, I, t I tell this and story. I appreciate you telling this. I tell this story um, when I'm when I'm doing workshops with youth and, and um, yeah, working with them around peer pressure because it's a classic example of peer pressure that right. influenced me to to start using drugs and the I started I started I just made the team. Went out, and they all invited me out one, um, that first week, invited me to go to a club and celebrate. And, and I was so stoked about, you know, guys I've been watching since I had been in, in high school. Now I'm on the team with them, and they're, you know, I'm building this rapport with them, and they're asking me to be a part of their group, you know. So I jumped in, you know, and, and I went out with them. I partied with them in about it you know, an hour, hour and a half into the night, uh, one of them came over to me and says, hey, e, check this out, man, meet us in the restroom in about 15 minutes. Right. Okay, you know, and I, I had no second thoughts about it. I had no, why they want to leave the restroom? Whatever, okay, these are my peers. I rushed myself to the restroom. I actually got there before them. I'm waiting, posted. When they showed up, they formed a little semicircle around me. My back was to the wall. And they all, each one of them hugged me and congratulated me. He says, you know, you want us now? And in that process, while they were doing that, one of the gentlemen reached in his pocket and he pulled out a little vial. And that vial was, uh, had white substance in it. He switched, he screwed the top off. And it was on the end of that top, there was, a, there was a chain and a little spoon at the end. He took that spoon and he dipped it back into the vial. Now, I got me in a semicircle, my back's against the wall, and he put that up to my nose. Right. So, welcome to the NFL. Right. Peer pressure at its totally. finest. Totally. You know, and when this peer pressure is there, you got about a tenth of a second <laughs> to, to make a decision. And in that moment, they're doing it, they have the fame, the fortune, everything that I, I've ever aspired for. I, I said yes. Of course, I'd seen drugs, and seen what it did right. to people, but now I'm with successful people, they're doing it, I tried it. And I experimented that day, and I identified it immediately with, the, with success. So, the more games we won, the more I partied. And party was including cocaine. Right. And what I noticed when I started doing that cocaine, that I get a little going too fast, so I needed something to keep me in the middle, drink hard liquor. 
And when I started drinking, it kept me in the middle. I could, I could manage, you know, what I, was, what I was doing. And I just kept going deeper and deeper over the years. Right. So this affected your ability to perform as a player too, right? Yes, it affected my ability to, to perform, affected my whole life. It affected my whole life, you know, and, and actually, you know, the, Bill Walsh called me into the, into his office, into a meeting um, <clears throat> after about three years, and, and you know, and, and he noticed that, you know, things were really changing with me. And he says, hey, you know, Eason, um, I want to help you. I'd like you to tell me what's going on, you know, and I, and he was reaching out to me the best he knew how. They didn't have the things that they, the interventions that they have now and the support they have now. He was reaching out to me and, and I, I told him, you know what, I, I'm good. Everything's okay, you know. And at this point, I had been with the 49ers for five years, you know, and I had, right. you know, established myself as, you know, a, you know, from my hard work and, and you know, somebody that, that would, would help people and, and a leader, you know. Right. And after our conversation, I told him I was okay. Shortly after that, I was called back and they told me they traded me. The Denver Broncos. <laughs> so, um, so you feel that uh, the, it affected your performance on the field, affected your personal life? Affected everything. And Every part of me. Using the ups and downs of various drugs and alcohol to moderate the influence. Yep, and the, the, the alcohol was, 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 was what I used to moderate, and it only, it only put me in, in, in deeper problems. Now, would you say you were addicted to cocaine and alcohol? I was addicted, yes. yes. And uh, at that time in the NFL, they did not have interventions. Uh, they didn't have random drug testing. How no, did you avoid that? None of that. They didn't have it then. But they knew. They didn't have it then. But the teams knew. But they didn't test us. Right up the management. So the management knew, and the folks at the NFL must have known that there was ubiquitous use of drugs and alcohol yes. by the players. Yes, yes. But that, that testing didn't come into effect until later on, after my career. Do you think the usage is more now than before, or less? How, are, how have things changed in the league? I think it's the same. I think it's, it's in terms of people are using just as much. Um, I think the, <clears throat> I think it's becoming more of an issue because it's it's finally been exposed. It's been exposed. It's out in it's public eye It's finally in, in public eye. Now it's like, okay, what's going on? And now it's, it's, it's a, an issue to put out there, you know. And before it was something that was kind of, you know, swept under the carpet, right. you know, kind of put in your little personal, personal folder and it didn't go out. Right. Now it's, it, it goes out and, and because it's, it's an issue and it should be. You know. right. it's, it's really out there, and it probably happened before, right? But you think it needs to be discussed? I think it needs to be discussed, and I think what needs to be brought out is, you know, the factor that alcohol has in all of those, crime, exactly. those crimes, you know? Alcohol is usually a factor in all of these domestic violence and all these murders. Somebody had a drink. Somebody, somebody binged. Now the league itself, NFL, is very much sponsored by uh, Bud Light, by by Anheuser Busch InBev, uh, by Miller Coors, by Coors Light. Um, now, um, very dependent in the NFL on um, advertising from alcohol sponsorships, and certainly at the Super Bowl we see it uh, writ large. Yes. Now, uh, do you think that has an influence on the locker room? That has an influence on the players? It does. It does. It has an influence on the players before, even before they get to the locker room in the NFL. As a teenager coming up, 
that has an influence on them from the beginning because that's America's, I'll call it America's number one problem with drugs. We certainly agree with that. It is the number one drug of choice for youth in America and for, for America and, and led by beer. Yes, yes, and, and not only being the number one, number one drug and number one problem, but it's, it's, it's now recognized as the gateway. The gateway that's leading all of, these, all of these teens and adults to a harder substance. Victim to false pride and I medicated you know, right. myself with alcohol and drugs to the point I was totally out of control and to the point where I was homeless, to the point where I was facing three strikes. And you almost sold your, your ring. Tell me your I, ring. I actually pawned my ring um, to, <clears throat> and the, the ring stayed in a pawn shop because I, <clears throat> I pawned a ring because I wanted money for, for more drugs, okay? And when I pawned my ring, you know, there's an interesting story behind it because the, the gentleman who, who had my ring um, connected with me years later and he says, he says, he wanted me to know that he still had my ring and that he had read about me and knew that, that I was in, in prison. And he wanted me to know that he was going to keep my ring. And if I didn't turn my life around and I didn't make it through, he was going to give it to my daughter or my son. That was a, a great person that did that for you. Yeah. Now, another person who came around back for you was Bill Walsh. <sighs> yes, Bill. Like I said, I was facing 35 to life on my third term in prison. I, I spent most of the 90s, well, all of the 90s, 10 years locked up in and out. And on my third term, I was facing 35 to life. And it was in Sacramento. Bill Walsh showed up at my arraignment. And he asked for permission, to ask the court permission to, to speak. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't seen Bill for years. Right. And when he stood up that day, I'm sitting there in orange, handcuffs, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh. and I saw him there and I was so embarrassed, I just dropped my head. I, I was already at the bottom, the lowest point of my life and, and I'd already given up, right. just given up. He spoke about a man that he knew, the Easton Ramson that he knew that came out and try it out for the team, and how, how the, the energy and the work and the fabric of, of the person that I, I was when I was there, and what he saw and how I helped other people, and what I did for, for homeless people. He, he knew that I would go out and do turkey drives and, right. and food drives and, and give back to the community. And he really admired those things about me but then he saw the change. And when he spoke that day, I broke down in tears. I had already dropped my head and I'm just crying the whole time he's speaking. Wow, because I, I wasn't that person anymore. And, and but that, you are that person. Man. And that moment I vowed, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to change. I'm going to do whatever it takes to change. And I didn't know what, was, what the future was going to hold for me, but I said, I'm going to change. Whether I get out of right. here or I stay here in prison. Right. And shortly after that hearing, um, I was notified that the judge had commuted that 35 to life to 28 months with half time. And when I found that out, I knew that I was going to go back to the streets. I just took immediate action contacting Walden House here in San Francisco. A recovery house. Yeah, because I wanted to get help. I didn't know how to do life clean and sober. So you had never done a clean and sober program or what a I, step program before that? I had done them, but I had, I, had, I had, I had, I did it because I had to. Right. I didn't do it because Eason wanted to or Eason wanted to change. And at this point, I became willing to do whatever it takes to change. 
and I became willing to take the small steps necessary. Right. And that was 15 years ago. So what would you tell uh, a young player today, say somebody who might be having, um, you know, don't want to mention any names, but uh, somebody who might be having some issues with drugs or alcohol and uh, those problems that come with it, domestic violence, DUIs, not paying attention. My message to, to, to that person would be to ask for help. And I understand that when we're in our, in our false pride and our, uh, our male role, that it's a very thing, hard thing for us to do. But if you can ask for help, you can change all of those things that are happening and you're doing to other people. You can change. You can unlearn the behavior if right. you ask for help. And don't give in to those peers. You don't give in to those peers. You ask for help, you learn how to change the people that you hang around with. So what would be your message to professional sports? What do they need to do to prevent players from going down the wrong path? And what, what would you like professional sports to do? I think they're, they're, they're making some of those moves in, in how to support athletes to stay clean and sober, but <clears throat> I think the message is being missed when, when the branding comes in and it's alcohol, because here's the big funder that's, that's helping or giving money, and you're you're putting them up on your stadium, and you're advertising, advertising them, and sending the wrong message. And I think that if you're going to work with with people in recovery, help them get in recovery, or and or when you recognize the signs, why not deal with what's causing that? Sure, and it would help prevent teens from viewing that as part of their lives and right. part of their spectatorship as well as their right. play. I'm here to tell you that uh, right. this is something that didn't just start when they got to the NFL, you know, most of the time. So, <laughs> so what do you think of, uh, of uh, colleges having beer sponsorships and selling beer in their stadiums? The same thing. It's the wrong, it's the wrong message. Crazy? It's the wrong message, you know. There's got to be other sources of there's money. Gotta, there's got to be other sources of money. The, mess, the message I drive home for them is, is to regroup and hang around the people they want to be like. Right Hang around the people they want to be like, and most of all, love yourself. You can't, you can't. Beautiful message. Beautiful message. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I got emotional. You, that's, that's wonderful, <laughs> Thank and you. you're a great person. I, I love you. what you do for the community. Thank you.